Tonight, Israel and Hamas are on the brink of a deal to release the hostages held in Gaza for nearly seven weeks. We'll have details and hear from one family desperately waiting for news. I'm Yalda Hakim, live in Jerusalem. A number of women and children held in Gaza could be released in stages in exchange for Palestinian prisoners. The Israeli Prime Minister said the deal will allow the military to prepare for continued fighting. We're going to continue with the war until we achieve all of our goals to wipe out Hamas, to bring back all of our hostages. I'll hear from a family waiting for news and desperate for their loved ones to come home. And ask how would a potential deal work and would it do enough to help civilians inside Gaza? Plus, we investigate this Israeli airstrike which killed four members of the same family in Lebanon. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Sky News uh, with me, Yalda Hakim, live from Jerusalem. Tonight, Israel and Hamas are on the brink of agreeing a deal to release the Israeli hostages taken nearly seven weeks ago. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says security chiefs back the deal, which would mean a temporary truce, and the deal will allow the military to prepare for, quote, continued fighting. Any deal is expected to include the release of Palestinian prisoners being held in Israeli jails. In exchange, our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, reports. They waited for hours for news outside the Israeli military headquarters while the government met to discuss the hostage deal. But then hostage families and their friends have had six weeks already waiting in a vacuum of information. I don't know. I hope they're OK, but we don't know nothing. While they protested demanding more action, Israel's prime minister said a deal to bring some of their loved ones home was close. I wish to clarify, we are at war and we're going to continue with this war. We're going to continue with the war until we achieve all of our goals to wipe out Hamas to bring back all of our hostages, all the missing persons, and to guarantee that there won't be any element in Gaza which is threatening Israel. And in Washington, Joe Biden was also sounding confident. My team is kind of the region shuttling, shuttling uh, between capitals. We, uh, we're now very close, very close. Uh, we could bring uh, some of these hostages home very soon. But I don't want to get into the, into the details of things because nothing is done until it's done. And uh, we have more to say, we will, but things are looking good at the moment. This is potentially the biggest diplomatic breakthrough since the war began. Even if the Israeli government approves the deal, though, it could still come undone through objections to the Supreme Court or events on the ground in Gaza. The families of the hostages face an agonising wait still. The deal could release women and children like Shiri Bibas and her little boys, Ariel and baby Kafir, the youngest of the hostages, only 10 months old, taken by gunmen on October the 7th. And Amelia Rolonely, abducted with her mother, Danielle, and her twin cousins, Julie and Emma, seized with their parents, Sharon and David. There are thought to be as many as 90 women and children being held in Gaza. Outside the cabinet meetings, frustration that the deal could be delayed. I'm really worried because uh, the deal is talking about mainly about children and this is just absurd that children are involved in this fight, in this war. We have to bring the children back now as top priority no matter what. Even when it's agreed, events in the war could upend this truce. An Israeli artillery shell or a Hamas rocket claiming mass loss of life. And the bombing and shelling will go on until the ceasefire begins. For those waiting to see the hostages come home, the pain will continue too until the moment they're out of Gaza. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News, Tel Aviv. 
Okay, let's go uh, live now to uh, Dominique, uh, who joins us from Tel Aviv. And Dominique, uh, you said there in your piece that this is such a significant uh, moment in, in this uh, conflict. I mean, it hasn't been uh, announced as yet, but it is expected to, to be announced imminently. It is, but there's uh, clearly some kind of hold up at Yalda. I'm outside the Kiryat, that is the uh, mi military headquarters of Israel, and inside there, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, has been meeting now for five hours for meetings that should have lasted for three. He's met with his war cabinet, his security cabinet, he's now meeting with the entire government, and, and something is holding up uh, the process that should be approving this hostage deal. I'm with the, uh, uh, the, these protesters, obviously hostage families, but also supporters and friends. They have been chanting outside throughout uh, this meeting, chanting at Chav, which is the Hebrew for now. They want action now. They want the priority to be put on their loved ones being got out of uh, Gaza. Going into the meeting, we know that Bezalel Smotrich and also Itamar ben Gavir, two far-right members of the Israeli government and the Israeli cabinet, said that they opposed the deal. They said it would be a disaster for Israel because it, it, it didn't put enough pressure on Hamas. It would ease the pressure off Hamas. They're supporters were over the road supporting that position and chanting against these protesters. Now, they don't have the power of veto in this meeting, but if they can lead a mutiny big enough of, of the government ministers, then the deal could be in trouble. I don't think we're expecting that to happen at the moment. But another hurdle happens once the deal is approved, if it is tonight, and that is that this, under this uh, under Israeli law, there's a 24-hour period where anybody who feels that they were a victim of the Palestinians who will be released by Israel in the other direction in return for those uh, hostages being held by Hamas, if they feel that they, uh, that they oppose this deal, they want to object to it strongly enough, they can take that objection to the Supreme Court, which could hold up this deal for a number of days, possibly. So we're not out of the woods yet. Things are moving in the right direction but there are delays here now and there could be delays tomorrow so that means an even more painful agonizing wait for these people hoping to get their loved ones out of gaza yeah, uh, absolutely, uh, Dominic. Thank you so much uh, for that up update. And uh, as Dominic was saying there, those family members just uh, behind him gathered there. They really have been uh, in Tel Aviv uh, and they were marching from Tel Aviv a few days ago to Jerusalem and back. They're desperate to have their family members uh, back. Uh, and uh, I saw them there uh, just uh, outside the Ministry of Defence yesterday. So uh, they've been uh, desperately... Uh, uh, you know, pushing the government, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with them yesterday uh, and uh, heard from them firsthand their anger, their desperation. Uh, but uh, let's uh, move on now. And the Qataris are crucial to these negotiations. They've been mediating with Hamas and negotiating for weeks over a release paired with a temporary ceasefire in Gaza. Let's speak now to Dr. Majid Al Ansari, spokesperson of Qatar's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Al Ansari, for joining us here on the program. We haven't uh, had an official announcement as yet, but we do understand uh, that it is imminent, uh, although we know that it's a very sensitive deal. It's also been incredibly complex, and Qatar really has been at the centre of it. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for having me, uh, Yalda. As, uh, as you might uh, anticipate all of us here in, uh, in Doha have been working on this for a number of weeks uh, now. The negotiation team here in, uh, in Doha has been spending uh, many sleepless nights and uh, weekendless weeks uh, hoping to get this deal uh, across. We are anxiously waiting for the decision that will come from the uh, Israeli government. We do believe that the work doesn't stop with, uh, with the finding and reaching this uh, agreement. It actually starts and we are looking forward to use it as a catalyst towards the escalation in the region as a whole. Yeah, I mean, since the beginning of, of this uh, conflict for the last 45 or 46 days, uh, Qatar has been central in first getting at least four people out at the, at the very uh, early uh, period uh, when uh, this uh, October 7 tragedy uh, began. But uh, if you can, just help us understand a little bit more about why it's gotten so close this time, why it's, it's evolved to where we are now. Well, Yalda, we've been working on this, as I said, for six weeks now. And as your report rightly mentioned, the situation on, on the ground was getting more difficult every day. With every escalation that happens on, uh, on the ground, the likelihood 
of reaching an agreement becomes more, more difficult. Beginning with uh, a reach out for mediation on the 8th of, uh, of October, we started seeing how we can reach a, an agreement between both sides that would, or how we can uh, develop a formula where both sides would agree to a version of, uh, of events where the hostages could be, uh, could be released, especially here we are talking about women and children, we're talking about civilians within these uh, hostages. And uh, as I said, every time there's an escalation on the ground, it becomes more difficult. We have reached the last stretch so many times now. We have so many versions of, uh, of agreements you know, that w came and went uh, through the mediation uh, process. And uh, we are now at the closest point we ever got to reaching an, uh, an agreement. I believe the, the discussions, the difficult discussions we've been having for the last uh, six weeks and, and the title's work that our negotiating team was, uh, was working on, we now have an understanding on what would both sides accept in the form of a deal that would end up with releasing a number of, uh, of hostages, and I said especially the civilians and the women and, uh, and children, and what would that entail on the other side. We are not only working uh, for that uh, goal, which is a hostage release, but we are working all together towards stopping the bloodshed, stopping the human suffering that is a result of what's happening right now, in, uh, in this part of the world, and also making sure that this, uh, this does not escalate into a regional conflict. And these priorities have been laid out uh, from uh, from day one. So it's in everybody's national interest and it's everybody's interest in the region and, and beyond to make sure that this agreement succeed, that we have a, a, a proof of concept to the mediation that we've been working on with our uh, partners in the region and uh, and beyond, and that we see you know that glimmer of light at the end of a very long tunnel that might lead us towards uh, a more hopeful uh, future in, uh, in this region. And as I said, the stop of the terrible bloodshed that's taking place right now. What we are seeing on our screens, what, uh, the, the news we are hearing is basically a daily uh, escalation into more radicalization in, uh, in the region and more loss of, uh, of life. And that well, will only... Well, uh, uh, the, the... The, the Israelis have continued to say that they no, not only want to demilitarize uh, uh, Hamas, but they also want to de-radicalize uh, Hamas. Is this something that you uh, and, and Qatar, I mean, Qatar as a state, do, do they actually think that this is possible, that Hamas can be removed from, from Gaza and, and be, uh, you know, de, de, uh, the de-radicalization uh, that, that, that they are hoping to achieve for that to be achieved? Well, the current escalation is, is the biggest vehicle for radicalization in, in the Palestinian uh, case, but also in the region as, uh, as a whole. The pictures we are seeing, the destruction, the level of death, uh, the targeting civilians and civilian installations in, uh, in Gaza, all of this is a vehicle for radicalization that we all need as an international community to make sure that it doesn't create a new iteration uh, of violence in, uh, in the region. And we've always said uh, that sidelining the Palestinian issue or dealing with it only from a security perspective would only lead to more violence. And this is what we have uh, right now in, uh, in, in the current uh, context. And therefore, it is very important right now to find a way to make this deal work and to use it as a catalyst. Because I can tell you out there that the work doesn't stop with this agreement. It starts with this agreement. Starting with this agreement, we are hoping to make it uh, a, a reason for more hope, a reason for the people in, in, in Palestine and in Israel to feel like there is still hope and peace in, uh, in, in, in this region. And uh, what we are hoping is that as a result of this agreement, we will be able to uh, launch a, a consistent uh, number of uh, truces that would lead to a de-escalation in, uh, in the region. Uh, we have all been hearing the rhetoric, hearing uh, you know, the, uh, the very strong language coming in from uh, both sides, but what we believe in very strongly and yeah. what our leadership has believed in always is that the only way forward is yeah. to find a way to negotiate a peace as the end of this crisis. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Dr. Majid Al-Ansari, uh, spokesperson for uh, the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs, thank you so much for joining us here on, on the programme and, and giving us a bit of an update. And as I said, uh, Qatar has been one of the, the key uh, players uh, in, in trying to reach a negotiation. Uh, but as we've also said, we're still waiting uh, to hear for uh, a, an official uh, announcement uh, that this deal has been uh, agreed. Uh, but as you've been hearing, a humanitarian truce 
uh, is close to being agreed to tonight uh, to potentially allow a number of hostages to be released. The Palestinian Health uh, Ministry says 14,128 people have been killed in the territory since the war began. That includes 5,840 children. Sky's Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkel uh, has this assessment of what could happen next. Have a listen. The Israeli military says that it has now surrounded the Jabalia refugee camp, a Hamas stronghold in northern Gaza. Fighting outside the Indonesian hospital in the camp has intensified in recent days. Hundreds of patients and civilians are reportedly trapped inside, but some of the wounded have now been transferred to another hospital further south in Khan Yunus. We went to schools, they bombed us. We went back to our homes, they bombed us again. Day and night the army was telling us to go to the south. We came to the south, we started walking at 9am. On the route we were detained by the IDF. They used us as human shields so they could move freely. For more than six weeks, the Israeli military has hit Gaza with thousands of airstrikes and carried out a large ground invasion to eliminate Hamas. They have destroyed most of Hamas's capabilities in northern Gaza, but not all. The frequency of Hamas rockets fired into Israel has decreased significantly, although not stopped altogether. Israel is clear that its mission isn't over. Senior Hamas leaders have not been captured or killed. There is more Hamas infrastructure to destroy, and there will be many hostages left in Gaza even after the expected truce. And so the IDF wants to start focusing on the South. The Israeli government is absolutely committed to continuing fighting, uh, to continuing to uh, achieve the goal that it has set for itself of destroying Hamas's military and governing capacity, even though there's no clear and objective measure for that goal and there's a very significant assessment that it can't actually be achieved because Hamas is so deeply embedded in Palestinian society in Gaza, especially because they've been in power for the last 16 years. And so there's very little question that Israel will continue fighting after this. 70 lorries of aid have entered Gaza over the past 24 hours. It is nowhere near enough. On a normal working day in peacetime, an average of 500 trucks go in. The expected pause in fighting will be a chance to surge the humanitarian aid as the situation in the south deteriorates rapidly. A truce will provide some relief from weeks of bombing for civilians in Gaza and for Hamas. The Israeli government and military is worried that Hamas will use the time to regroup, reposition and rearm. As the number of casualties continues to rise in Gaza, Israel knows that they will come under increasing international pressure to turn a temporary pause into a permanent ceasefire. Alice Bunkle, Sky News in Jerusalem. OK, let's speak now to Mark Regev, senior advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu, who joins me live now uh, from Tel Aviv. Mr Regev, thanks very much for joining us uh, here on the programme. I know we continue to hear you say it's not done until it's done, uh, but we are hearing from the Prime Minister. We know that the government is currently meeting. Just bring us up to date uh, on where things are at. Uh, I've just uh, been there now. Uh, uh, the government conversations are still going on. We've obviously got, like in Britain, a, a cabinet system. And in the end, for this arrangement, uh, for this framework with uh, to facilitate the release of hostages, for that to be uh, approved, the full government has to vote, and that vote is still pending. It might happen in an hour or two, but they're still talking there. The ministers are still discussing the issues. We are expecting it tonight, though, are we? Yes, I believe so. Then you have to know, Yalda, there's still one more uh, 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 point that has to be done. If the deal that is approved by the government includes uh, uh, the release of people held in uh, Israeli prisons, if it includes the re uh, release of, of terrorists who've been involved in murdering Israeli civilians, uh, in that case, the family... They're, 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 women, they're women and children uh, as well, aren't they, Mr Regev? Uh, they're, they're, they could well be. But if they are in jail because they were involved in violent extremism, and no one is in a jail for, for, you know, for anything less of these people, if they're involved in violent extremism, the families of the victims of their crimes have the right under the law to petition the Israeli Supreme Court 
uh, and to protest the release of someone who's guilty of, of, of being involved in the murder of a loved one. And that's but, a process but if we look that at could the add... Details, it's 100... It's 150 Palestinian women and children. The request is for, for 150 Palestinian women and children to be released. Is that correct? I can't go into the numbers. I apologize. Until the deal is finalized by my government, we're not going into any particulars. I apologize. But it's clear that if well, terrorists... Well, there's a lot of information uh, that... That, that's coming through. Um, and and I, I know what you're trying to say, and there's this 24-hour window where that can be petitioned if families aren't Correct. happy. If that is the case, and, and 150 of these uh, women and children in, Pal in Israeli prisons, uh, the hostages, the, uh, the prisoners that are uh, held in Israeli uh, prisons, if that petition, uh, you know, is put through and, and you're saying that uh, if the families say that they shouldn't be released, where does that leave this deal? So, first of all, the Israeli Supreme Court, which is, of course, an independent uh, branch of government, uh, in the past they have not overruled the government on these things. Obviously, they have the right to do so, but in past decisions, in similar cases, they have not. So, on the assumption that the government tonight approves the framework for the release of our hostages... Uh, then let's say a 24-hour period uh, comes in where the Supreme Court hears the petitions on the assumption that it rejects the petitions and allows the government to go ahead, which I think is a reasonable assumption. That means we can start moving on this deal on Thursday, hopefully see, seeing people uh, come home immediately. And we're looking at roughly about uh, 50 hostages over about four or five days. I apologize, Yelda, but I, at this stage, I'm not uh, going to go into any details of, uh, uh, of, of what's on the table. I can say the following. Uh, if there is a, a, a temporary cease of, a ceasefire to facilitate the release of, of hostages, uh, that's something that Israel has said uh, already weeks ago that we're willing to do, and Hamas has only agreed now. And you have to ask, why have Hamas agreed now to do it? And the answer, I think, is simple. We're hitting them hard. The Israeli Defense Forces has been destroying their underground infrastructure, has been taking out their, their military machine, has been eliminating uh, senior commanders. They are desperate for a timeout. And for us, it's an opportunity to get people out. Well, let's talk about the ceasefire, because could this be extended uh, beyond just, say, if you have 50 people uh, the, of the hostages that have come out over, say, four or five days, could the ceasefire be extended beyond that point? Well, there's a deal, which I can't go into uh, the details of it, as I, I said before, and I do apologise. But uh, theoretically, if we were to get more people out, we would consider extending the ceasefire, but only if it was a way to facilitate the release of hostages. Look, they're holding close to 240 people. Now, they're not letting them all out. That's not on the table, unfortunately, even though the international law says they should all be released immediately and unconditionally. But Hamas is not abiding by that, obviously. We'll get some of them hopefully out when, when the government reaches its decision later tonight. Uh, but we still are committed to getting them all out. And if Hamas is willing to let more out, of course, we'd be willing to extend uh, the ceasefire. Let's talk about uh, the uh, operation in the north, uh, because the uh, Gaza uh, Health Ministry, uh, and I know you're going to say to me it's the Hamas-run uh, health ministry. Well, it uh, is. The numbers it that is. are coming out now, are w w it, it is, but it, the numbers that are coming out at the moment in terms of the casualties uh, are about uh, 14,000 uh, dead, uh, about 5,500 of those uh, are, are children. Do you think that if the ceasefire or the truce, the humanitarian truce that we're looking at over, say, four or five days, um, you know, that international pressure will then mount on Israel to, to stop the fighting, to stop the war, uh, because, of course, the death toll also continues to rise. So, first of all, allow me to question those numbers. It clear, it's clear Hamas has a, an interest in inflating the numbers. And, of course, Hamas is not telling you how many of those people uh, of that inflated number are combatants and how many are really 
innocent civilians who were caught up in the crossfire. And, and we understand that. Uh, we understand that. But those numbers are not being disputed by the UN, for example. And the no, but the UN, yeah. That's, that's, one our, that's, one that, that, that's one of our complaints. That's one of our complaints against the UN, that they automatically parrot Hamas's numbers where no one rational would accept the numbers of a terrorist organization uh, without uh, at least a large grain of salt to say no. Uh, these numbers have to be questioned. Well, well, the State Department, Mr. Regev, the State Department, the U.S. State Department, has said that the numbers could be much higher than what we're looking at right now. So I haven't heard that, but I have heard the State Department and your Foreign Office in Britain and the European Barbara Union Lee, all say... Uh, uh, Barbara, all Lee, say who's, Barbara Lee... Oh. Barbara Leaf, who is the top Middle East uh, 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 diplomat uh, for the United States, has said that the numbers could be much higher than what we're looking at right now. So uh, I apologize. I wasn't aware of that statement and I'm not aware in what context she said it. But uh, if, if you'll allow me, the, the, the Americans, the British government and the European Union have all said publicly, have spoken about Hamas's deliberate policy of using Gaza's civilians as human shields for their war machine. I've said it in the past and I'll say it again. In normal countries like the UK and Israel, uh, uh, the job of the military is to protect the civilian population. Hamas inverts that. They deliberately embed themselves in hospitals, in schools, in civilian neighborhoods, using Gazan civilians as a shield for their machine. And surely, if one wants to talk uh, about Mr. civilian Regev, casualties, the, 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 Hamas has to be blamed. The, Mr. Regev... I ask you about the numbers because I know that Israel is now focused on operations potentially after this uh, uh, pause or truce uh, on the south. Um, are you sort of going to use the same uh, operational tactics as you did in the north on the south? And, and will it be as messy as, it, as it's been in the north? So the truth is, once we've sent in our ground forces, we, we, we've actually uh, uh, seen a, a reduction in the number of uh, civilians caught up in crossfire. And that's a good thing. And we are committed to trying to reduce the number of civilian casualties. We don't want to see a single civilian caught up in the crossfire. But you have to counter our approach and contrast it with Hamas's approach, which is to deliberately see civilians killed to protect their war machine. So while we, Israel has been calling for civilians to leave areas of conflict, uh, areas where they can get caught up in crossfire, Hamas has been doing the opposite, ordering people to stay. How does one explain this behaviour? OK, Mr Regev, uh, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us uh, here tonight uh, from Tel Aviv. Thanks for having me. OK, let's get uh, more analysis now from Sky's Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkel, who joins me uh, now. Uh, Alistair, hearing there from uh, Mark Regev, uh, first of all, he was not giving uh, much uh, detail uh, about this deal. But uh, from what we understand and from uh, conversations that other Israeli officials have had, we understand that it's roughly about 50 uh, hostages that may be released over a humanitarian pause, a truce of about sort of five days. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's been a lot that's been drip-fed to Israeli media throughout the day. Uh, and so we can have some faith in, in their sources. So I think we're looking at about 50 um, hostages released, women and children, um, at least in the first instance, and probably staggered over a number of days. And in return, we would expect to see quite a significant number of Palestinian prisons, prisoners held in Israeli jails, possibly around 150. So that's a ratio of about three to one. Uh, there's going to be a lot of other detail as well that we're going to need to see. Uh, we understand that Hamas might be saying to the Israelis, we don't want you to fly surveillance flights over Gaza for a certain period, for example. Uh, and we'll see whether or not the Israelis have agreed to that. Just to put some detail into what I understand is happening right now in the Israeli cabinet. The way the Israeli cabinet normally make decisions is you'll go around the table, show of hands yes, show of hands no. As I understand it from quite senior sources, they're actually going around minister to minister to minister and getting them to give their opinion in some detail. And that is why it is taking time. And that is why we might not have a final answer on this for quite a number of hours. I did think it was quite interesting that Mark Rever blamed Hamas for uh, torpedoing any potential deal thus far because we've been up the hill and down the hill quite a number of times we we don't know we don't know why we have we've not had a hostage deal thus far but what i would say is that this moment if it comes presents us with a very interesting dichotomy uh, will it provide hamas with a breathing space in order to try and regroup and rearm or does israel feel that it has now got such 
a sufficient upper hand militarily on Hamas that they can afford to take a break in order to then hit them again. Yeah, and certainly the Israelis feel like they are, uh, you know, calculating this and taking a bit of a risk, but we'll uh, continue to, to watch and, and monitor and get uh, your analysis. Uh, thanks so much, Alistair. Now, this is a Sky News special program on the Israel-Hamas war coming up. We hear from the family of 35-year-old Yalden Roman Gutt, who uh, believes she is being held hostage by Hamas and are desperate for her to return. Welcome back to this special edition of Sky News, live from Jerusalem. I'm Yalda Hakim. Now, across uh, Israel and all over the world, the friends and family of the hostages will be anxiously waiting for news of their loved ones. I spoke to the family of Yarden Roman Gat. Hamas fighters entered her home and kidnapped her, her husband and young daughter, on October the 7th. But whilst they managed to escape, she was taken by her captors and is believed to still be in Gaza. This is her story. <laughs> a mother and daughter sharing a moment of joy. But October 7 tore this family apart. 35-year-old Yeldan, who was visiting family in Kibbutz Beri in southern Israel, was taken hostage by Hamas. Her husband Alan and three-year-old daughter Gefan managed to escape. The family believe Yeldan was taken to Gaza and is among the almost 240 hostages. Even now, when <laughs> we know that this is happening and she's there, I still don't really get it. I, it's something that you just can't accept and to really realize it's just... Sometimes, like I feel like right now, I feel like I'm telling you um, about the movie that I saw last week. I'm not really can realize that I'm talking about my sister. That right now, when we're sitting here in this house, our house, she's there somewhere. Yeldan's brother Leri says the past 46 days has been a nightmare and especially difficult for his niece. She knows exactly what happened. She knows exactly what happened. She knows better than I do. She was there. She saw everything. She heard everything. She didn't understand everything. For her now, when she's playing with dolls, the dolls are hiding under the bed when there are bad people getting into the home. Tonight, as plans get underway for some women and children to be released from Hamas captivity, Yeldan's family are desperately hoping she's among those coming home. She misses mom. It's been 44 days. It's a three-year-old that just misses her mom. And that was uh, Liri Roman ending that report. And joining me now, uh, and you saw her in, that, in my report there, is Ronnie Roman. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ronnie, for joining us. And, of course, you are Yaldan's uh, sister. Just uh, give me a sense of what you're hoping for from this news that might come out tonight, that there is a, a deal that's imminently going to be announced. Hello. Good evening. Um... For us, it's a very nervous evening and uh, probably a night and uh, the few more days to come. Um, we're all, all the families are, I think, excited to see hostages back home safe and also afraid and nervous about the one that won't be back home. Um, but I'm choosing to believe that um, this deal that I hope that will come and will start will be only the beginning of everyone, all the, of the hostages, uh, bringing them back home. But Ronnie, at this stage, have you been contacted uh, by anyone from, from the government or any other entity uh, to, to say whether Yeldan might be in that group? No, not at all. Uh, we know only from the news. Um, yesterday, uh, we were in the cabinet meeting uh, 
And we just told that uh, there is a process and uh, that there might be a deal, but we haven't heard anything new. And just tell me a little bit more about how you're feeling, because, of course, we met yesterday. Uh, we just showed our viewers uh, my report there, uh, and there's still a lot of um, grief and emotion. Uh, you talked about your shock and the fact that October 7 has felt like one long day, uh, even though it's been 46 days uh, since your sister went missing. Yeah. Um, I think that right now uh, I am mostly very nervous. Um, I have a lot of hope that I actually really don't want to be that hopeful because I want to be prepared for the option that my sister won't be back this time and this week. Um, so we're like in the middle of hoping and preparing to the worst that she might not be back. And it's hard. It's very hard to to be in the middle of it, to find the exact point that we also have a hope to wake up in the morning and to continue work and act and talk and put the pressure so the deal will be and that my sister will be back, um, but also not to be very uh, depressed when she won't be here this time. Well, uh, Ronnie, uh, we thank you for sharing your, your story with us and uh, we hope that Yaldan is uh, part of the group and uh, she will be able to make it home. Uh, we will continue uh, to uh, bring our viewers your sister's story and, and the story of your family. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll stay uh, in touch with you over the coming days. I just uh, want to say one, now, one more word that these days are very are very uh, critical and we need the help of everyone to help us that this deal will be uh, and and also afterwards this deal we need to bring all the hostages back home so we need you to support us so everyone will be back home and not only the children the children must be back home now but also all the women and all the men and everyone Ronnie, thank you very much for joining us here on the program. Thank you. Now, to tonight marks a huge moment in the Israel-Hamas war. Let's uh, get more now uh, on the West's response uh, to today's uh, developments. Uh, let's go straight to the United States and speak to our correspondent, James Matthews, who joins us from Washington. And uh, James, of course, the United uh, States has played uh, perhaps the most critical uh, role in, in this negotiation, in this deal, uh, but, but also throughout the last 46 days. Hi, Yalda. Yeah, you're exactly right. Joe Biden has been front and center of these negotiations. The Americans talk about how they've been on the case of the hostages hour by hour. President Biden remains in the White House. We last saw him in the Roosevelt room this morning when he said a deal was very close. He's expected to leave soonish. Uh, there's been no sign of any departure yet while he and everybody else awaits confirmation of any deal. It's a big one for Biden. He needs a result in all of this. Um, he is a man who has thrown himself into the heart of the matter in terms of trying to steward this conflict as best he can. But for all his input and his posture as a player of influence to steer the conflict, I think um, events have exposed his limitations. He has been embarrassed by the divergence between what he wants and what Israel sees fit for itself as it proceeds to pros and prosecutes this war. Biden has described the release and safe return of the hostages as his highest priority. We are now six weeks in, so that, you know, it's some measure of success, but there is some way to go, and it gives cause perhaps to recalibrate America's influence in all of this. It has been a conflict of unrelenting horror where Biden has tried to make a difference in terms of urging Israeli restraint, pauses in the fighting, humanitarian aid. It has been difficult, drawn out and not delivered in full. It's not strengthened Joe Biden, quite the opposite. 
James, uh, thank you so much for all of your analysis there uh, from Washington. Well, let's get uh, the uh, view now from the Foreign Office. And our chief uh, political correspondent, John Craig, joins us. And uh, John, uh, the UK's new uh, Foreign Secretary, Lord uh, Cameron, is due to come to Israel soon. Uh, but has there been any reaction from the Foreign Office tonight uh, about this deal and, and, and the fact that it may be announced imminently? No official reaction yet, but the Prime Minister has repeatedly pledged uh, that the British government is doing everything it possibly can to secure the release of hostages in Gaza. Now, uh, he has already had a meeting with Noam Sagi, who was interviewed by Sarah Jane Mee on Sky News earlier this evening. His mother is a hostage in Gaza, and uh, that is one of the, uh, obviously one of the British uh, hostages that the government is trying to, uh, trying to free get freed. Um, the Prime Minister and the new Foreign Secretary actually are uh, at Buckingham Palace tonight for the lavish banquet for the President uh, of, uh, of uh, South Korea. Uh, so obviously they'll be ke being kept in touch. Lights are burning brightly here, as you might expect, as they try and get as much information as they possibly can from the Middle East. The Prime Minister will obviously give his first response tomorrow uh, at Prime Minister's questions. Obviously, uh, last week there was the big vote, a couple of votes, uh, on uh, calls for a ceasefire, SNP calling for that, uh, the, uh, the, um, um, the, the, uh, the uh, Labour Party, of course, had that big rebellion. But uh, the Prime Minister will stress the efforts that are being made. As for Lord Cameron, well, before he took this job, this new job, he described Gaza as a prison camp, which didn't go down too well. He's back to two-state two solution, but he's yet to make a big intervention in the Middle East. He was today making his maiden speech in the House of Lords on, on international trade. So he's yet to really pronounce on uh, his uh, approach to this crisis in the Middle East and indeed, of course, uh, the hostages. He will be hoping that his first pronouncement will be some good news, uh, but we await, uh, await the first statement on uh, the Middle East from uh, Lord Cameron and his new job. OK, John, thank you so much uh, for that update. Now, uh, joining me is Ricardo Perez, a UNICEF spokesperson. Thank you so much, Ricardo, for joining us uh, here on the program tonight. We are uh, expecting a humanitarian truce uh, to be announced imminently here. Uh, but, of course, uh, in the last uh, few weeks uh, since this conflict uh, began, since the aerial bombardment and, and the ground offensive that we've seen uh, from Israel, we've heard the UN Secretary General say uh, just a few days ago that the civilian death toll in Gaza is unprecedented and unparalleled. He also spoke about uh, the thousands of children who have been killed in this conflict. Thanks for having me, Yalda. Indeed, uh, since 40 days, 46 days now, children have been living a relentless nightmare in the Gaza Strip, uh, a, 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 a true horror. Um, they, they, they've been killed, uh, they've been injured, uh, they've lost family members, they've lost family uh, loved ones, they've lost their homes, their hopes, and, and they don't see any perspective of this improving right now. They're, they're going to bed every night or whatever they're managing to shelter without knowing if they will survive the following day. So uh, Gaza right now has become literally a, a graveyard uh, for thousands of children, uh, a living hell for everyone else. And without sufficient supplies, fuel, uh, without water, conditions for children will, will plummet. And of course, uh, we also understand uh, that, that there are several dozen children being held uh, by Hamas as well, these hostages uh, that, that may be released uh, over the, the coming days. Uh, there's a concern about their health and, and well-being as well. Absolutely. Uh, UNICEF has been calling for a humanitarian ceasefire uh, for a while now and, and the release of all hostages that have been held captive in Gaza and, and taken from their homes, including many children. Um, they've been living through horror. We, we saw the testimony before uh, on the show, um, and, and, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, it's very concerning for us also about the mental health of these children who've been kept, held captive, and also the mental health of, of children in Israel who, who are now also living through uh, many and many days and weeks of, of distress, of, of 
you know, the, the, the intensity and the threat of conflict, and let alone children in Gaza, we have over 5,000 children reportedly killed uh, and 9,000 children reportedly injured. That's an average of more than 400 a day. Yeah, that's, that's a staggering number and, and unacceptable. Uh, indeed, and, and hopefully this uh, humanitarian uh, pause uh, will will uh, be able to uh, you'll be able to assist many of the the children and take advantage of it, and, and hopefully lead to uh, a lasting uh, ceasefire. Thank you so much, Ricardo, uh, for joining us here on the uh, program. Well, that was uh, Ricardo Perez, a UNICEF spokesperson there. Now, the events of October 7 has brought so much pain and suffering to both the Israeli and Palestinian people. This is a significant moment in this conflict, which will hopefully bring some respite to the people here. We will continue to monitor the development, developments and bring them to you here live on Sky News. But for now, back to you in London, Anna.